box to uh, ask questions. Uh, I find that works a little bit better than raising hands and un unmuting because um, it's just easier to find the chat. So as uh, Dave is doing his presentation, feel free to type in the chat um, any questions you have, and then we'll get to them at the end of the presentation. Um, and with that, I'm going to pass it over to Dave to do a little introduction and uh, start his webinar. All right. Well, good morning, everybody. Can, can everybody hear me okay? A thumbs up is, uh, is good. Awesome. Thanks, Colin. All right. Well, thank you very much to the Muskoka Conservancy for, for having me today. I've been looking forward to this for, for quite a while. And um, yeah, today I'm going to be talking to you all about snapping turtles and some of the really amazing things that we've learned about them uh, in nearby Algonquin Provincial Park. So I'm going to share my screen and this worked perfectly earlier, so it probably won't right now. Um... All right, we, uh, are we good, Aaron? And we're not on presenter mode? You're good. All right, great, thank you. So today I'm gonna to be uh, sharing with you a presentation that I've done on the snapping turtles of Algonquin Provincial Park. And uh, really the, the point that I wanna get across is that these are really amazing creatures. We learned a lot of really amazing things about them uh, in the park, and we still have a lot more to learn about them everywhere. So um, thanks everybody for, for coming and thanks for, for having me. Um, I want to share with you some of the, the interesting things I found out about these really, really amazing creatures called the snapping turtle. They're definitely one of my all time favorite animals, um, despite them not being rare um, or endangered or anything like that, or you know, particularly endangered at the moment. Um, they're really, really fascinating creatures. So I'm going to be speaking for about 45 minutes, and then at the end, uh, I will take the questions that uh, that you all may put in the chat box, and Aaron will uh, sift through the questions, and he'll ask uh, he'll ask them to me, and I'll answer them as best I can. So I've studied reptiles and amphibians pretty much my whole life, uh, since even before going to grade school. Um, I've done some actual academic research on reptiles and amphibians, particularly amphibians. I did uh, my master's uh, research on amphibian road ecology in Algonquin Park, uh, and I've done a bunch of other sort of minor research projects on, uh, on reptiles and amphibians. Um, just to let you all know, I have not actually done any professional research on turtles, so I'm not the, the turtle biologist in the park, uh, although I'm a big fan and a big supporter of what they do. Uh, I'm more of an enthusiast, and I'm going to share this uh, with you all today. So my turtle story starts, um, well, I, when I was a little boy, and I was obsessed with dinosaurs, like really, really obsessed with dinosaurs. I had the dinosaur books. I drew pictures of dinosaurs all the time. Uh, it's all I could talk about was dinosaurs. And I came to uh, a realization um, in probably about 1990 was that I would never actually meet a dinosaur myself in real life. It's like they were extinct. They were gone and I wouldn't ever be able to, you know, meet one in person. Jurassic Park wouldn't come out for another four years, and um, you know that hadn't spawned that that sort of uh, uh, curiosity or creativity, and that we could you know clone them. So I started looking at my dinosaur books and what kinds of animals were around at the time of the dinosaurs that are still with us today, and you know one came to mind um, was this. This is Archaeolon. This is the biggest turtle apparently known to have ever lived. It's a gigantic sea turtle from flipper to flipper across. It was almost three and a half meters across, like 12 feet. It was enormous, well over twice the size of any living sea turtle today. So I was thinking, oh, amazing that there were turtles then and there are turtles now. Uh, so like there were like this sort of adjacent to a dinosaur creature that I could go out and study and maybe get to meet myself. And maybe like the most prehistoric looking of all of them uh, that we have, at least in our part of the world, is the snapping turtle. 
So I've got this black and white picture here, um, you know, showing, you know, this, this ancient looking snapping turtle uh, basking up on a log with its big dinosaur like tail, the spiky rear edge of the shell, and this great big head. Um, so I, I was pretty captivated by these creatures. So if I ask everybody, um, I think there's a good chance that maybe you've encountered a snapping turtle in your travels in Muskoka or elsewhere. They're generally a pretty familiar creature to us, but despite being an animal that many of us have seen, have seen maybe not as common as squirrels or white-tailed deer or anything like that, but we've probably seen one. Um, we didn't know, we don't know too, too much about them. They're still fairly mysterious and uh, there's a lot to learn about them, but Algonquin Park was one of these places where a lot of really important discoveries have been made about snapping turtles. But before we get into that stuff, we need to, you know, clear the air a little bit. Snapping turtles have a little bit of an image problem. They do have a little bit of a bad reputation. And here we're going to find out why they have a little bit of a bad reputation. So the first one is, they, well, of course they bite. They're called snapping turtles because they snap at you. Well, why do they snap? Why, why are they so defensive or try to scare us off? Well, if we compare them to another turtle, uh, and this is a Blanding's turtle, we've got um, the turtle's famous shell. So turtles all have shells, uh, but they're not all made the same, or they, they're not all equal in protection rather. So the top part of the shell is called the carapace, and this is um, that domed part. It's made of expanded uh, rib bones and vertebrae. So just like our ribs and our vertebrae, um, instead of being, you know, the shape that ours are, they're all flattened out and all fused together to make this, this dome. And same thing with the plastron underneath. These are modified bones that have created this carapace and plastron. So now that you guys know those two words, carapace and plastron, you're actually experts in turtle anatomy. Most people don't know these words, so that's, uh, that's good. Now, the Blanding's turtle is really lucky in that its lower shell, its plastron, even has a hinge on it. So you might be able to see this um, sort of right in the middle of the shell, um, going from side to side. Um, there's a hinge there, and it allows the shell to go from flat to fold it up a little bit, and it closes up um, where the head and front legs are and where the tail and back legs are, really protecting it from predators. It's truly amazing. So many turtles have um, shells that provide really good protection. It's certainly the, the turtle's you know, go-to move is to draw its arms and legs and head into the shell to protect itself. But our friend the snapping turtle doesn't quite do this. So this is just a small snapping turtle. We can see its plastron is very, very reduced. It offers you know, not very much protection at all. Its fleshy arms, legs, uh, head and tail are left pretty exposed. So a predator, uh, whether it was a raccoon or a fox or a raven, or even a, a person, should they be so inclined, could easily poke at uh, the legs or bite and chew them off. So the snapping turtle, instead of having a really good shell for protection, um, protects itself with its sharp beak. And if it feels threatened, it will tell you to back up by potentially snapping towards you. And if you get too close, it may bite you, just like pretty much any other animal. <laughs> The second reason is that, and maybe you've done this before, you've been out fishing, you've had a nice, uh, nice catch of fish, and you've put them on a gill chain or on a stringer off the side of your boat or off your dock, um, only to come back an hour or two later and there just be fish heads left and you see the snapping turtle uh, swimming away after it's, eaten, after it's eaten the good parts of your fish. Snapping turtles often feed on dead or dying animals and a fish on a gill chain or a stringer is basically as easy as it gets. You've done the work of catching it. You've put it in a place where it can't get away. It's maybe died while it's been, uh, been strung up there while you're keeping it fresh in the water. And the snapping turtle's like, yippee, I found, I found lunch. This is great. Um, something I have learned um, over my time of, you know, living with my wife or sharing an office with people, if you leave food laying around and you come back and it's gone, you got what you deserved pretty much. Because if you leave something really tasty around, um, it's going to get eaten. So that's what happens with the snapping turtle. So if you're, uh, if you're going fishing, put your fish in the cooler. Don't, don't leave it off the side of the dock or off the side of the boat. 
So snapping turtles, despite them being pretty familiar, we talked about like maybe their bad reputation for snapping or for um, eating uh, fish uh, that maybe we wanted to eat. Um, they're actually pretty amazing creatures. And, you know, if you spend a few minutes watching them, they're actually quite captivating. Uh, they can be surprisingly graceful in the water. Um, they can certainly get quite large, very impressive. Uh, and I, I can't help but look at them every time I see them out in nature. So to get to the, the heart of the matter, what do we really know about snapping turtles? Well, uh, we already talked about that business end where um, if you get too close, they might bite. We know that they can get very, very large. So a big snapping turtle shell can be uh, about 40 centimeters long, sometimes a little bit bigger than that. And with their tail and their head stretched out, they can be over a meter in length, which is like a really big reptile. They can weigh uh, up to 40 pounds and in some cases a little bit bigger than that, uh, but they can be quite large and they're certainly very prehistoric in appearance. They live in a variety of aquatic habitats, whether it's lakes or marshes or bogs, um, even streams, things like that. They're not too, too fussy about aquatic habitats. As long as there's permanent water, they, there, there might be a snapping turtle living in it. Even in temporary pools, they might spend, you know, short parts of the season there. They occur over a very wide range in North America. So we're up a... Um, up in this area up here. So um, the stars where Algonquin Park is, uh, but they occur from Florida to Northern Texas to uh, Montana and Idaho uh, and into Saskatchewan, Manitoba and uh, Southern Quebec and, uh, and Nova Scotia, New Brunswick. Uh, but we are at the Northern part of their range. So maybe they do things that are a little bit different here than they do elsewhere, just because it gets so cold for so much of the year. They are, in fact, reptiles. So like lizards and crocodiles and alligators and snakes, uh, they are generally cold-blooded. So their body temperature relies on uh, being warmed up by the sun. So most cold-blooded animals don't end up being able to make much of their energy um, the way we do. We're mammals. We're warm-blooded. Our metabolism is driven by the food that we eat and our metabolism stays at the same temperature all the time unless you have a fever or you have hypothermia. Uh, but we need to eat a lot to keep our metabolism up really high, whereas reptiles and amphibians, for example, are cold-blooded. Their metabolism, they need food, obviously, to operate, but uh, if it's cool out, their metabolism is low. If it gets warm out, their metabolism increases. Uh, and many reptiles will bask out in the sun to increase their metabolism so they can raise the temperature of their body to be able to increase the amount of food they can eat so they can grow faster, so they can get to a bigger size more quickly and that's good for reproduction, uh, all sorts of things like that. A few years ago, I encountered this snapping turtle that was a very, very large turtle and it had climbed up, up on top of this, uh, this fallen tree and was perched up on this, uh, on this root. And we were out on a canoe trip. And as we got closer, uh, I, I noticed that this turtle was asleep. And then as we got a little bit closer still, it woke up with one eye and then both. And then it was startled because it saw us. And then it splashed into the water with a huge splash. Uh, but that turtle was basking. In many parts of their range, snapping turtles don't really need to bask because it's sufficiently warm most of the time. Uh, but where we are at the northern part of their range, um, they definitely bask to warm up um, because they don't know they don't always get a lot of warm sunny days. So diving into the questions about snapping turtles, there's a lot that we didn't know about them. And our story really starts back in the, you know, many, many years ago, approaching 50 years ago, uh, back in 1972. And this story, it starts with Southern bog lemmings. So this is a cute little teddy bear or hamster-like creature. Um, so it's just itty bitty. Um, small mammals are prone to dramatic fluctuations of their population. So some years there might be a lot and some years almost none. And it could bounce back and forth like this or it could cycle through over a period of years. Uh, but it changes a lot. And there was a graduate student, a young fella uh, from the University of Guelph. He was going to come up to Algonquin Park to collect 
some southern bog lemmings uh, for his doctorate work. So he was going to try to get his PhD in population ecology of southern bog lemmings. So he comes up to Algonquin Park and he's having a really hard time uh, finding any of these uh, of these bog lemmings um, because their population has crashed. So he's like, well, you know, that's not good. But at the University of Guelph, they had a captive colony of them. Uh, so he wanted to compare some stuff with wild ones, with captive ones, uh, to captive ones. And uh, so he was thinking, okay, well, we've, we still have some out in the, in, the, in the lab, which is good. And then enter this creature here. This, uh, this looks a lot like a fisher that maybe you have around your cottage or home, uh, or maybe you've seen one in Algonquin Park. This is actually called the Teira, which is like a Central or South American version of, a, of like a Martin or a fisher. And they had one of these, the University of Guelph and their animal holding facility, and it escaped. And then it broke into the bog lemming enclosure and ate all the bog lemmings. So this student couldn't catch any bog lemmings out in the wild and all the bog lemmings they had got eaten. So he was thinking he was gonna be in really bad shape for his PhD research. So uh, like any good graduate student or any good problem solver, um, he called up his, uh, his, uh, his PhD advisor and said, uh, bad news about the, about the lemmings uh, on both fronts. Uh, what are we gonna do? And he's like, well, um, maybe we can, um, Try doing some research on on those turtles, maybe that's that's not what we were planning. But um, he's like, we noticed they come up and they nest on the dam at the Wildlife Research Station in Algonquin Park every year. Maybe we can do something with those. We don't know very much about them, but maybe we can try. So um, that summer in 1972, they start marking some of these turtles as they come up and nest on the dam. So this is totally by accident. Uh, so here we've got one with uh, some painted numbers on the shell, 887, uh, and then we've got um, some notches. So uh, the researchers would take a small triangular file and notch um, a couple of notches into the, the, the edge of the shell of the turtle. So that would act as sort of a permanent mark on the turtle. Uh, the turtle shell is living material, so it's bone covered with a, a substance like our fingernails. Um, this probably doesn't feel very good for the turtle, but it is a very, very minor injury. So, and it heals up very nicely. And then in many cases, a small metal uh, tag, or I call it a license plate, was wired to, to the back or to the shell of the turtle. So they were able to permanently identify these turtles in this research project, at least for the duration of um, the researchers' um, doctoral work, his PhD work. So within you know, a couple of years, they start seeing the same faces over and over again in that lake at the Wildlife Research Station. And they, they start figuring out their, their annual patterns of movements and what they do and where they go. Uh, so this was pretty exciting stuff because they didn't really know that at that time. Turtles were just around and you know, could they possibly even do anything interesting? So one of the things that they started to figure out fairly early on is there were some small turtles, there were some medium turtles, there were some really big turtles, um, and they were curious about how long they lived. And this is one of the original turtles from that 1972 part of the project. Uh, his name is X-10, and he was, he was caught back in the 1970s, and he hasn't really grown any since the 1970s. Reptiles usually grow their entire lives. So when they're just little babies, uh, like the picture on the left, uh, they grow very, very quickly. Um, because they're born, they're about the size of a loony, and they want to get as big as possible, as fast as possible, so they don't fit in the mouths of any predators. Uh, so their shell hardens and they become, you know, safe and they can start living as an adult. As they get bigger, though, so they, they've, they've grown very quickly while they were young, and once they get to sexual maturity, which is usually over 20 years of age, their growth starts to slow down, and then it starts to get nearly flat, like a, their growth sort of flat lines. And they might grow maybe a millimeter or two a year, but hardly any uh, for potentially a very long time. And the turtles, the, the turtle researchers were trying to figure out where some of these really big turtles were on this growth curve. And it turns out that some of these turtles, the really big ones that were really big in the 1970s, uh, many of them are still really big right now, and they haven't really grown very much in that time, which suggests that they are probably very, very old. 
Uh, and we don't really know how old they are because turtle researchers don't live long enough to properly study them. And we haven't been studying them long enough either. Um, some of the researchers estimate easily well over 100 years, um, which is a uh, you know, pretty conservative estimate. Um, and by some estimates, they could be over 300 years old. We really don't know because we, there are very few known age turtles out there, especially very, very old ones. Where do the turtles go? So if you live so long, do you, do you live in the same place your entire life? Well, this particular turtle here um, was encountered early in the spring, in May, um, back in 2011. And a turtle researcher and I, we had gone out to this pond to actually look for salamanders. And it was shortly after the ice had melted off of this pond. And we could see, you know, something protruding from the, the surface of the water. It was the turtle shell just poking up out of the water a little bit. And uh, I waded out into the icy water. Um, that, you know, like I said, there was still chunks of snow and ice in some parts of the pond. Uh, and we, I grabbed this, this big turtle. And it, lo and behold, it had a metal tag on the back of its shell. And uh, the, the researcher that I was with, his name is Patrick. And Patrick has what I like to call turtle recall. If he's met one of these turtles, he remembers who it is. And he's met hundreds of turtles in his time at the, uh, the Wildlife Research Station. The number on the tag was Y12, and he had no recollection of this turtle. He had never seen it before. He'd never laid eyes on it before. So we carried this turtle back uh, all the way around the pond, and then we carried it over the portage, and then we put it in our canoe and then paddled it back to the Wildlife Station where we had the big binder of all the turtles. And it turned out that Y12 his name was, you know, he had a nickname called Cujo because he was the meanest turtle in the whole study. We didn't think he was that mean, but he wasn't that warm. Um, so he wasn't moving too fast. Uh, but he had been missing in action for 13 years. The researchers hadn't found him in 13 years and he was one portage away from the wildlife station. So he'd just been hanging out there maybe that whole time, who knows. Uh, but, you know, they can travel some distance. They can hide out in some places for, for quite a while. Um, but uh, the point of this was that the researchers thought that maybe he had died a long time ago because they hadn't found him in quite a while. But turns out he'd survived quite a while longer. He had just been hidden from view for a bit. So at this time of year, we are encountering turtles on the move. And uh, the motivation for that movement is maybe not what you think. It's definitely not because they are cup crazy and they're on the on the move to uh, get better seats for any of these hockey games, but it is rather to go lay their eggs. <coughs> Excuse me. So right now is turtle nesting season and many adult female turtles are on the move to go find a good place to nest. And for many turtles, uh, dry, open, sandy places with some gravel uh, are particularly appealing and she'll go and lay her eggs in a hole that she has dug with her back feet, deposits her eggs in there, buries them up, and then leaves them alone. She never gets to meet her babies. Snapping turtles don't start laying eggs till they're about 17, 18 to 20 years old. So they've got to wait quite a while till they grow from that little tiny hatchling into a suitably sized turtle. So they do a lot of growing before this happens. Those researchers found that some of these adult female turtles would move up to eight kilometers one way to get to a nesting site. So they might go from several lakes up, uh, up, the, up the chain to get all the way down to the dam, for example, at, uh, at the Wildlife Research Station to lay their eggs. So it was a pretty long way to go. And then they would go all the way back from where they came from in order to, uh, to, to go back for the rest of the summer. These researchers uh, would pay attention to where the turtles nested and they would actually dig up the eggs and count them and weigh them and measure them and all that uh, to figure out do big female snapping turtles lay more eggs than small ones and do they provision them differently. So um, does a small turtle lay a few big eggs or does it lay many small eggs? Um, so what, what is the strategy here? So just to give you an idea, um, all of the round eggs these are snapping turtle eggs, and there was 34 of them in that clutch. So um, a normal sized clutch, um, you know, they can be from 30 to 40, uh, in some cases up to 60 eggs. 
um, and potentially even more. The eggs on the right hand side of the picture, the oval shaped eggs are actually painted turtle eggs. And there's, uh, I think, seven eggs in that clutch. And that's fairly normal for painted turtles. So uh, five to 10 is, is usually lots. So our little snapping turtles that uh, the eggs are laid in, the, in the, the, the sandy gravel and they're buried and they're left in the warmth uh, for, for quite a while uh, to hatch. Um, some interesting things happen to them while they're incubating. So unlike people whose gender is determined uh, by genetics, um, so while we're gestating a human baby, um, the snapping turtles is much, much different. So they are temperature sex dependent. So this means that the temperature of the baby turtle is dependent on the average temperature that it was incubated at. So for females, um, the, or for males rather, a nest will produce only males if it's incubated between 21.4 and 27.8. Females will be produced, only females will be produced uh, if it's just warmer than that, but not too warm because then it'll end up cooking the eggs and uh, females will be produced cool, uh, at temperatures cooler than that, but not too much cooler. And then they otherwise won't hatch because they just won't have been warm enough. So the researchers figured this out because they were artificially incubating eggs indoors in, in incubators that were on flat trays and they had them at different temperatures and they figured this out um, by uh, examining some of the hatchlings and dissecting some of the hatchlings that, that, um, that were sacrificed to, to check this out. Um, however, we think about this in an actual turtle nest. So if you imagine the way that the female turtle digs the, the nest, it has a tube, so like the, the hole, and then there's like a big round part down here where all the eggs are down here. So out of each nest, there are usually males and females that hatch out. Um, so the eggs at the outside maybe get a little cooler. Um, so they would maybe be females. The ones in the middle uh, might be mostly males because they retain the heat and they're being kept warm. And also there's sort of warmer temperatures in the upper part of the nest and cooler temperatures in the bottom part of the nest. So there should be males and females that hatch out from most nests. Unfortunately, many of those nests don't actually survive. So this time of year, we end up seeing a lot of this. This is a turtle nest that has been dug up and eaten by a predator. And um, if you see eggshells strewn about all over the place, it usually means that a predator got to the nest. If the baby turtles hatch out, the eggshells actually stay in the ground and the turtles filter up through the soil to get out and disperse. So some of the likely culprits uh, for eating the turtle nests include skunks, foxes, and raccoons. These are uh, creatures that are very adaptable uh, to living near people. They're good at eating all sorts of garbage that people put out, and they're also very good at finding their own food. So they don't usually have a shortage of food, um, and uh, they, their, their numbers can get to be very, very high. If you think about raccoons in the city of Toronto, um, raccoons don't attain that, that density, that number of raccoons per acre or per square kilometer anywhere, but in cities, they definitely don't do that in natural places. Ravens and crows also dig up some nests uh, and they can also uh, predate some of the adult turtles as well, just, just like these animals do too. So remember earlier, I mentioned that we're at the northern part of the snapping turtles range, or just about. So central Ontario is about as far north as snapping turtles go in, in, in our part of the world. Some years, it doesn't actually get warm enough, long enough to incubate turtle eggs fully. So even if the predators don't eat all of the eggs, sometimes it's not even warm enough for the turtle eggs to hatch. There was a few summers ago where it felt like it rained every single day and it was very cool for a good part of the summer and we had almost complete nest failure where none of the, the, the hatchling turtles hatched out. So here we've got our adult female snapping turtle. She's digging a nest on the side of a, a, of a gravel road. Uh, she's gonna be putting her eggs into the soil. She's gonna be burying her eggs and then she's just gonna leave. She's, never, she's not gonna have anything to do with those uh, with those eggs or those hatchlings ever in her life. Um, and she's not even really going to know who they are, or even if they, they live near her, she might have some kin recognition of those babies, but uh, she doesn't take any care of them. Uh, for a long time, I used to joke that 
Um, maybe turtles have like mastered parenting by the burial and leaving uh, leaving them behind. Uh, next month, my wife and I are having a baby, um, and I'm guessing I probably can't use that strategy in real life. Now, in some cases, 99% of the turtle eggs or, hat or, or nests that, that are laid, uh, they get predated or fail um, because of temperature or predators. So it's really important that that turtle tries again next year. Um, so this is a numbers game and they play a long, long game. Now, should those baby turtles, um, are, should they be lucky and they manage to survive um, the predators that try to get them when they're an egg, that the temperature is just right so they can incubate properly and they can hatch out, that little baby turtle will hatch out usually late August or early September and they need to get to the water fairly soon. Uh, the researchers um, put like a fluorescent powder on several broods of baby turtles to see where they would head out as soon as they were released from, from like their hatchling, hatching site. And they found some pretty interesting stuff. So they were up on a, a rail bed. There was a wetland right in front of them. There was forest behind them. And they put the fluorescent powder on the turtles, they let them go, and they came back at night with a fluorescent light, so they could actually see like a little trail of powder that they left behind. And about half of the baby turtles went right to the water, as they expected, but the other half went in every other direction. And who knows what these little guys are thinking. Um, hopefully they know what they're doing, but uh, it was it's very mysterious. Studying baby turtles is very, very hard, um, and they're very, very difficult to find again. So as we all know in our part of the world, uh, summer is amazing, fall is spectacular, and it does mean that you know, we're hopefully going back to school, uh, the temperatures are getting cooler, uh, our sweaters come out of the closet, um, and the spectacular display of fall colors will, will soon be there for us to see. Uh, but if you're a cold-blooded animal like a turtle, it means that you are going to go through um, some changes in how you live. So the carefree days of summer and just swimming around and feeding um, are, are starting to end and that you're going to need to hibernate fairly soon. So what about winter? Well, if you live in a lake, uh, like many of our snapping turtles do, lakes or ponds, uh, and you're in our part of the world, you know that they're eventually going to freeze over. There's going to be a solid sheet of ice over many of these bodies of water. You or I, if we were swimming around under the ice, we would soon need to come up for air. And uh, it, you can't because there's you know this much ice up on top. Um, so we would quickly suffocate, we would drown. But for the snapping turtles, they do something a little bit differently. They're going to hibernate underneath the ice and uh, because they're cold blooded, their demand for food goes way down, their demand for oxygen also goes way down so they can spend the winter um, tucked away somewhere, uh, hopefully in a safe spot. So to figure out what turtles do over the winter time, for a long time researchers thought that they would bury themselves in the muck and in the mud um, and just spend the winter sort of in a, in a cozy spot. Uh, and it turns out that that wasn't quite true. So uh, turtles like this Blanding's turtle, for example, but many snapping turtles were also outfitted with radio transmitters. It's a little device that's about the size of a AA battery. It was glued onto the shell and it emits a radio frequency that can be followed with that big antenna that, I, that I'm holding in the picture here. It emits a very specific frequency that you need a machine to uh, receive and then amplify. And the researcher can follow the beeps basically to where the turtle is. Most of this research gets done in the warm season because that's when the turtles are active. That's also when there's usually a lot of students available to do the work. But in the winter time, things are a little bit different. The turtles don't move very much. And we often thought that this was not a terribly interesting time of year for reptiles. Uh, but this biologist here had followed a turtle to its overwintering site and then had cut a hole in the ice. And he's about to lower a camera down the hole uh, that's like a live video camera to see actually what the turtle is doing. And this surprised many researchers uh, as to what kind of spot the turtles would pick for a hibernation site, because we thought that they'd be tucked away under mud and muck and all that stuff. Uh, and they didn't think they'd really be able to see them. But when they got that camera down there, it turns out that many turtles actually just hibernate on the bottom of the pond, lake or river, not under anything. They're just on the bottom. 
And the reason for this became really apparent after we figured out how turtles spend the winter down there uh, and, and why this is really important. So um, the turtles are actually getting a little bit of oxygen from the water. So we can't breathe underwater. The turtles normally can't breathe underwater uh, very well. Uh, but in the wintertime, their oxygen demand is so low that they can take a little bit of water in um, through a special part of their body and absorb a little bit of oxygen and get rid of a little bit of carbon dioxide. So every time we breathe in, we take in oxygen and we breathe out, we expel carbon dioxide. The turtle for the wintertime is doing this through its bum. So it is doing this through its cloaca. Uh, so this is this uh, universal opening on the, on the turtle's tail. It can take in a little bit of water, take in some of that oxygen and expel a little bit of carbon dioxide. So that's how they get through the winter uh, with so, so little oxygen and not being able to get to the surface uh, to breathe. Now, Aaron talked about a really cool observation of a snapping turtle in a creek getting to the surface to be able to breathe all winter. Some turtles do that if, they're in, uh, if they've got access to open water. Most of them don't for the winter time. And I'm gonna show you guys why they normally don't do that. It's because of these guys. So if there's open water somewhere over the winter, air breathing mammals like these mink, or sorry, these, these river otters um, can catch them. And during the summertime, otters don't usually bother with snapping turtles because the snapping turtle is pretty big, it's strong, it's pretty good at defending itself. It can stay underwater for a very long time, even though the otter can too for a couple minutes, the snapping turtle can stay down there way longer. But in the winter time, the snapping turtle is nearly defenseless. And each year, um, many snapping turtles are caught by otters if they're in a place where there's a bit of open water and the otter can swim up to them, grab them, and then bring them up to the edge of the ice where they will actually kill and eat the turtle. Uh, and this is really the only time that the snapping turtle is vulnerable. So a lot of them choose not to hibernate in places where there's going to be a lot of open water. Um, and this keeps them away from this, this one particular threat. So wintertime in our part of the world might last up to five or six months. We're gonna speed through that because the turtle doesn't do it too, too much at that time. Uh, but those nice days of spring, they're soon upon us and the ice starts to melt, the snow starts to melt, and then the turtle season starts anew. So that turtle that spent, you know, five or six months hibernating in the bottom of the pond or lake is really keen to, to get its season going. Uh, it'll come out of the water or come into shallow water to bask to speed up its metabolism. Uh, this one here we found a number of years ago and it was basking out in the sun. It was covered in muck from crawling through uh, a mucky part of the pond to get to, uh, to, get to this uh, clump of sedges. It may have even spent the night buried in the mud just close to the good basking spot and then came out and then warmed up um, in this convenient location. Once they get warmed up, turtles turn their attention towards the mating season. Uh, so uh, this is a pair of snapping turtles. Um, and the one that we can see its mouth open definitely doesn't look happy. And these aren't, uh, it's not a male and female, but it's actually two males fighting over females. Um, they bite and scratch and thrash. And they're really trying to figure out who's the dominant turtle in that part of the lake and who's gonna mate with the females in that area. Um, or like a lot of mammals, male snapping turtles are bigger than female snapping turtles, and it's because they fight like this. Um, but for most reptiles, it's usually females that are bigger than, uh, than the males. Uh, and this is to accommodate more space in the body to, uh, to produce eggs, for example. So a bigger female turtle produces more eggs, which is good for, good for reproduction and good for a population. Uh, but in some species that fight, the males will be bigger than the females. Some of those turtles get pretty badly beat up. We found this guy basking out on a bog mat uh, a few years back. He was all scarred up on his head and neck and his eyelid had been torn up. Uh, he had lots of scratches all over his body. And we presume that he had a little bit of an infection. And if you're a turtle, you're cold blooded, you can't, your body can't give you a fever to fight off an infection. But this guy went up and he was basking up on the bog mat in full sun and he was trying to speed up his metabolism perhaps to create a behavioral fever. So he was uh, 
creating his own fever by laying out in the sun. And the faster his metabolism went, the more his body could heal up maybe a little bit faster. So um, I thought this was a pretty clever thing that this turtle had done. This was also a really big turtle. He was quite large. Uh, I would have loved to have seen the turtle that beat him up because he presumably was even bigger than this one. Now, should that social order be sorted out, um, hopefully there's a, a mate nearby to, uh, to meet up with. Um, this is a pair of snapping turtles, a uh, photo that uh, a gentleman sent in to me a number of years ago. So the male is the, the larger one in the back, the female is the one in the front. And they were out in front of his campsite while he was on a lake trout fishing trip. And he described this as being a, a beautiful and graceful sort of pursuit um, in the water. It was almost like a, like a, a paired ballet in the water. Um, these two turtles uh, approaching the act of mating. And this actually looked like it was probably quite the date because in the background here, that white item up in the, the upper left corner of the screen is actually a lake trout skeleton that they had thrown back in the lake. And in the female's mouth, you can actually see there's a little bit of of lake trout in her beak there. Um, so it looked like quite the dinner and a date. Now we've learned a lot about uh, turtles and how they live here in the park, but we would be remiss if we didn't talk about uh, some of the trouble that turtles are in. And I'm not even just talking about the chocolate ones that show up in my house. Southern Ontario has um, a pretty big threat to turtles and, and other wildlife, and it comes in the form of roads. Um, in this image here, all the black lines represent, you know, a road of some consequence, something that's fairly wide. It's not just a dirt track or anything like that. It's usually a paved road. In Southern Ontario, there is no, or in Southwestern Ontario rather, there's nowhere that you can be that is generally more than 1.5 kilometers away from a road. That would take you about 20 minutes to walk on flat ground, which most of Southwestern Ontario is. So if ever you get lost down there, just pick a direction and walk for 20 minutes and you'll encounter a road. You won't be lost anymore. Now, remember when I said that some of those female snapping turtles travel up to eight kilometers one way to get to their nesting site? Even if they travel one or two, they will probably have to cross a road. And if you were a slow moving large animal like a snapping turtle, uh, crossing a road is very, very dangerous because um, you could get hit by a car just like us if we don't look both ways. So that adult female snapping turtle, she leaves the wetland at this time of year, usually mid June to go lay her eggs. There's a really good chance that she will have to cross a road. And if she crosses a road, she may get hit by a car. Those snapping turtles, they don't start laying their eggs until they're about 20 years old. Uh, and because they have such a poor success rate for, uh, for, their, for their nest, actually even just surviving. And then those little hatchlings that do hatch out, their survival is very, very low too. So it's very, very important that that female lay lots of eggs every single year. So if an adult female snapping turtle lays 40 eggs a year for 40 years, that's 1600 eggs, she might be able to produce double that number of eggs over her lifetime. So if she lays well over 3000 eggs in her lifetime, two of them need to hatch out to become reproductive adults to replace her and her mate in that population once. That's so the population just stays the same. It's not gonna get bigger, it shouldn't shrink, but it should stay about the same. So if this turtle gets hit by a car, let's say when she's in her 40s, she probably has not laid enough eggs for to play that numbers game for her, her uh, population to stay this, the same size. Many turtles are lost uh, by, by getting hit by cars every year uh, and their populations are declining in some places fairly quickly. If you do see a snapping turtle crossing the road, there's a couple of things you can do. I will stop and help one cross the road. I will pick it up and I will move it across the road. That's not for everybody. And there's a couple of things that you must remember when you were, if you are going to help a turtle cross the road. The first one is that only do it if it's safe for you to do it yourself. Never ever risk becoming roadkill yourself to help a turtle cross the road. I can't, I can't stress that enough, but you've got to keep yourself safe. Now, if you do want to help a turtle cross the road, 
you can pick it up by the back of the shell. So if this is the back of the shell here, you can pick it up like that and carry it across the road. As mom always said, uh, point away from face because that snapping turtle um, doesn't know you're trying to help it. It thinks you're gonna try to eat it and it's going to tell you to back up and it's gonna do this by snapping at you. And they can snap about halfway back over top of their shell. So please be very careful. Otherwise, you can put one into a cardboard box. If you've got like a box or a tote or a bin in your car, you can sort of scoot one into the box and then drag it across the road and then dump it out on the other side. You can get, um, as I'm sure all good Canadians have, and you still have one in your car right now is a snow brush. You can get the turtle to bite the bristly end of the snow brush and drag it across the road. And um, that uh, ended to let go of the snow brush once you let go of the snow brush yourself. Um, you can do that. Or if it's not a very busy road, you can sit there and just watch it and wait for it to, to cross the road. Um, but there are very few roads that are not that busy. The other really important thing to remember is that that is an adult female turtle. She is on her way to go lay her eggs, most likely. And she knows exactly what she's doing, even though she might be leaving a wetland on one side of the road and going towards um, uncertain habitat on this side. She wants to go there to do something very important, and it's to go lay her eggs. So always bring the turtle the direction that they're heading in. So if they're going that way, bring them that way. In some places, um, people have put up um, wildlife crossing signs to encourage people to break for wildlife, to but be aware that there might be wildlife on the road. In some places, these really help and um, have, have helped prevent some road mortality. In other places, there's been large eco passages that have been constructed under highways. So this is a, a big tunnel. It's big enough for a moose or a bear to walk through, uh, but other small animals will use this too. So we've got this big chain link fence up on the side with uh, this black fencing at the bottom, and it's creating a funnel right to the tunnel and many animals will cross underneath, so, um, so some of them don't get hit by cars. These work fairly well, but they're only as good as the fences that guide them to the, uh, that, that guide them to the tunnel. So we found out that, you know, a bunch of great things that have been found out about turtles uh, in Algonquin Park. We've learned a little bit about how they live, what some of the threats that are facing them, uh, and what we can do about it if you do happen to see one. Um, I'm going to end by talking a little bit about where turtles sort of sit and how, and how maybe I think of them and how maybe other people think of them too. Uh, for the Indigenous people in our part of the world, um, they might refer to North America as Turtle Island. And part of the story comes from uh, a time when the world was totally flooded and people couldn't live there because it, it was just water. And all the animals and the, the, the few people that were left, they got together and decided that they would dive down to the bottom of, of this giant lake or this ocean and collect a handful of mud and they were going to put it on the turtle's back, they were going to spread it around, and that's where they were all going to live, on the back of the giant turtle. Um, I think this story is really amazing in that it teaches teamwork and humility and uh, what we can do when we work together. Uh, and also, the, the, the turtle is kind of the hero of the story, at least the way I see it. Um, I was reminded of this story a few years ago when I found this big turtle with all, all the mud on its back. And um, I like to think that um, if, our, if our world is a giant turtle, then we really should respect it. And maybe it makes it easier to respect it when we think about it as, as a giant turtle that's our home. This little hatchling turtle that hopefully hatches out this fall um, is hatching out into an uncertain world. And, you know, what happens to the wildlife around us eventually happens to all of us. And it's really important that we care for our planet, to care for our wild spaces, and to care for each other, because it's, it's really all we have. Despite being really familiar to all of us, um, snapping turtles, they're, they're still fairly common, uh, although they are declining fairly quickly. Uh, we've learned lots of really thing, really interesting things about um, about turtles, like reproduction or that temperature sex dependence, um, how they move to get to their nesting sites, um, and maybe even close to understanding how long they live. We still have a lot more to learn. Algonquin Park is a, a real hotbed for research, uh, and even though it was accidentally a place where turtle research happened, uh, it has become a really long-term research project, and it's taught the world 
a great deal about turtles and turtle research and conservation. When I think about Algonquin Park, um, I think about scenes like this, canoes and pines and lakes and rocks and trees. Um, and that snapping turtle is right up there too. It's a part of, a part of our park, it's part of Muskoka. Uh, when I think about Algonquin Park and a big turtle swimming around the perimeter of a lake, I like to think about a researcher following it, trying to learn about it um, and unravel its secrets one at a time. Lastly, if you do get a chance to go to Algonquin Park, up on the Mizzy Lake Trail, where a lot of this groundbreaking turtle research happened, there's a, a panel that was a, an interpretive panel that was put in to commemorate the contributions of Dr. Ron Brooks. He wasn't that original stu student that started that turtle project. He was the original student's PhD advisor, and he's since become a world authority on turtles and turtle conservation. So if you want to learn a little bit more about that, um, go check out uh, Post 7 on the Mizzy Lake Trail. Uh, and this is Dr. Ron uh, in front of the panel with his picture on it, and he was uh, he was awfully touched because it was a it was a surprise when uh, when it was installed. Um, and if you want to support some of this amazing turtle research, please check out the Algonquin Wildlife Research Station. Uh, so here's their contact information, and uh, yeah, if you want to uh, find out more, um, please do please do look them up. I want to thank everybody for coming out today and uh, thanks for listening to me talk about turtles. I could do this all day, uh, but I know you guys have other things to do too. Um, but thank you very much. And thanks to the Muskoka Conservancy for, for having me. I really appreciate it. And uh, now I will take some questions for, for a little bit, if, uh, if there are any questions in the chat. Okay, fantastic. Thanks so much. Really uh, incredible talk. Uh, we do have some questions um, that were typed during. Uh, one is uh, regarding Cujo Y12, um, and why did you take him to the research station? Um, and then did you return him to the pond after you were done? That is a great question. So uh, we did bring Cujo back to the wildlife station. Um, and because we, uh, the researchers didn't really know this turtle uh, and he hadn't been seen in so long, they wanted to bring him back so they could measure him, weigh him, um, check out his, um, like other, uh, features to see if he'd grown any in that time. Uh, and he was brought right back to that very location. Yeah. That, so that's the really important thing is that the turtles might be brought to the lab. It's usually for a day or less, and then they're brought right back to, uh, to, to where they were caught. So they do that with hundreds of turtles every year. Um, they keep them in a, like a big plastic pail or a tub um, and not usually even overnight, but usually for, for just part of the day and they get them back to where they're going and what they were doing as quick as possible. That's a great question. Uh, okay, I've got another question regarding um, a past study population, which you may or may not know of. Uh, Ron Brooks had an otter go through Lake Sasajuan Yes. and wipe out quite a lot of the study population. Has it recovered and do you know how long it took? All right, so that's a that's a great question too. So this is a real turtle project aficionado. So Lake Sasajewan is the lake where the Algonquin Wildlife Research Station is. That's where the dam was, where um, the, the turtles would nest on. Uh, so in the 1980s, there was um, an otter or possibly a family of otters that ended up killing and eating about 20 of the, the turtles that live in that lake. And that was roughly half the population of, of adult snapping turtles in that lake. Um, to date, that population has yet to recover to that number. So that was uh, about 40 years ago. So it can take a very, very, very long time for a population to recover from a natural event, like, like an otter predation event. Um, imagine what happens if, you know, two or three turtles a year are lost to road mortality. Um, and they're primarily female turtles that are lost to road mortality too. So that population will be very, very, very slow to recover. We probably won't live long enough to, to see it fully recover. Um, great. Uh, we've got a student from, or a question from, I believe one of the students, uh, why are turtles slow and why do they live in water? All right, that is a great question. So turtles are slow for a couple of different reasons. Um, primarily, they don't need to be fast. That shell, um, it offers them really great protection against predators. And if you think about this, we can be fast because our legs come off of our, like below our body. So they go straight down like this. So we can walk um, pretty quickly. Imagine even an animal like your dog. Now imagine how fast your dog would go 
if their chest were touching the ground and instead of their legs like this, they were off to the side like this. So that's, that's how a turtle is. So um, yeah, it's, a lot of it has to do with the position of their legs uh, and how heavy their shell is. So their shell is made up of bone and uh, that tissue that's like, like our fingernails, keratin. Uh, so it makes things pretty heavy. The turtles that live in the water, um, they swim very, very well in the water. They can actually be very, very fast in the water. So just like when we're in the water, we're buoyant. Um, we don't have that full effect of gravity on there. So we can float a little bit and we can swim. I don't think people can swim as fast as we could run, but we can move pretty quickly in the water. Uh, and the turtles end up floating and swimming and they can swim quite fast in the water. That's a great question. Uh, okay, do you know what the oldest turtle alive today is? <laughs> Ooh, <laughs> um, I don't think scientists know which turtle is the oldest turtle alive. I know that there are many examples of some of those giant tortoises that, are, um, that have at least survived over 170 years. Um, there was a box turtle in the eastern United States, just a fairly small turtle like that, that survived to be over, I think, 130 um, I am sure that there are some very, very old turtles out there that we don't know how old they are. Um, but yeah, there, there's a couple of giant tortoises that are approaching about 200, um, that are known to be about 200. And I'm sure there are many more that are, uh, considerably older than that. Another question regarding, um, when they move, do they only leave their habitat to lay eggs or would they move for other reasons as well? So snapping turtles, because of that skimpy little plastron, the, the lower shell, they don't like to leave the water for any reason. And the only reason they really voluntarily do that is to go lay eggs. So it's primarily the females that do that. Um, they sometimes do migrate otherwise. So you could imagine a time where maybe a beaver dam blows out and the pond dries up and the, the, the turtle won't just stay there. It'll go overland to, to find another habitat. Uh, some turtles will make annual migrations to places where they like to spend the summer and then other places where they like to spend the winter and they'll move over land. Uh, but in general, snapping turtles, if they can avoid going out of the water, they, they really try to avoid it. Um, okay, I've got another question regarding the, and this is a good photo actually, the snails and grubs and other things stuck to the shells. Um, do they have a problem with parasites or is this like a mutual thing? All right. So, um, so if you're referring to the photo that I've uh, that I'm showing here, um, it actually has a number of leeches stuck to its neck and to its shell uh, and to its chin. Um, these are smooth turtle leeches that that really just they just love sucking the blood of turtles. Um, parasites like this generally aren't too too much of a problem. Um, so it's sort of like us, right? Like I usually go and donate blood fairly regularly. I don't need all of the blood that I have to survive. Uh, so I can spare some of it, just like we donate some to the mosquitoes and deer flies and black flies around us. But it can be kind of annoying. And if they're super infested with leeches, they could potentially have like um, some amount of blood loss, uh, which isn't ideal. Um, leeches actually don't feed a lot. So there might be a lot of leeches on that turtle, but they're not all feeding all at the same time. But that is one of the reasons why the turtles will come out of the water and bask out in the sun. As they start to dry off, the leeches will maybe fall off or decide to leave. Um, the turtles will have other parasites. So they might have like blood parasites that possibly are transmitted by the leeches. Uh, they might have like tapeworms uh, and, and um, other roundworms in their body. Uh, that they get from some of the food that they eat. Um, but in general, most parasites don't normally cause a lot of harm to the host because that parasite really wants that host to live really well and not notice that the parasite is in there. So uh, well, um, well attuned parasites rarely hurt their hosts. Uh, and a question regarding the temperature data for the eggs, is that absolute? Um, like all females are below 21.4 or is there like some wiggle room? Um, so because that was done in the lab, so imagine that you set your, uh, your oven to 350 degrees to bake something. Uh, so once it's preheated, you assume that it's staying roughly at that temperature the whole time. So they were finding that turtles incubated below that temperature consistently would produce females and, and in that range it would be males and then over that range to the like below the critical temperature um, would produce females again. 
in wild nests that temperature fluctuates every single day it fluctuates throughout the season um, so it ends up producing males and females in the same nest um, but yeah generally it's it's very um, very rigid if the, the eggs are incubated at that fairly really specific temperature uh, okay just a couple other questions uh, one how do you estimate turtle age <laughs> You can't really. So this is this is the this this question that turtle researchers have been asking for for a while now. Um, when a turtle is small, so let's say a, a, bi- a young snapping turtle that's about this big, they will actually have growth rings on each scute of their shell, and you can count those and you can make an estimate. So if there's under ten of them, you can count them and you can say, well, okay, it's probably ten or, or less around 10. Uh, but once the turtles become sort of adults, those rings get smoothed right off just through the, the wear and tear of life. And you can't really count them anymore. And uh, from there, it gets to be very, very difficult to estimate age. And the only way to know for sure is to know how old the turtle was or like when it was born. And then you count every year after that. Um, and this has been a really hard thing to do in turtle biology. So um those researchers, they will try to estimate where the turtle is on that growth curve. So is it in the part that's growing very quickly? Is it in the part that's growing kind of slowly? Or is it on the part that is like nearly flatlined in in growth? And um, yeah, they're still trying to figure out at what age like that, that flatlining really starts to happen. Um, because you know, it might take 60 or 70 years, maybe more. Uh, and they've only been researching these turtles for, for about 50 years now. So it's, uh, it's really quite special how long these animals can live, um, but it makes estimating their age very difficult. Uh, okay, and the last question, do turtles, turtles have teeth? Ah, that's great. So um, if we even have a look at this image here and we look in this turtle's mouth, it does not have any teeth. So turtles um, are strange among reptiles in that they don't have any teeth, but instead of teeth, they have like a hard beak uh, that covers the bones of their their upper and lower jaw. And this actually is keratin, just like our hair and fingernails, and it can make a pretty sharp edge. And uh, this is what they use for cutting and pulling at their food. Um, So uh, a snapping turtle like this, let's say it got one of my bass off of the gill chain, they would grab it with their mouth and then they would pull and tear at it with their claws and they would shred and rake it uh, until it was in pieces small enough for them to swallow. So they don't have teeth, but they don't, they don't really need teeth. Um, and uh, if, if this animal were to bite you, um, it could potentially puncture your skin with like the, the tip of its beak. Um, its jaws are fairly strong, but it cannot take your fingers off. Um, despite any of the, the urban legends, they can't take your fingers or toes off and they can't bite through a broom handle either. Okay, fantastic. So I think that's all the questions. Um, thanks so much for uh, joining us today and, and giving your presentation. We appreciate it a lot. Um, and I hope everyone enjoyed it. It will be available afterwards. Um, we'll be posting a link on the website. And uh, yeah, hope everyone can go out and uh, find a couple turtles today. All right. I will answer the one last question. Uh, Do turtles poop? Yes, they do. If you eat, you got to (laughs) poop. All right. Thanks. Thanks so much, everybody, for the nice comments. And thanks for, uh, for all the great questions, too. Okay. Have a great day, everyone. All right. Take care. Something.